Hello, my name is Robert Hall. I am a contributor for the Svelte, the Svelte team. And I um, developed a, um, I, I actually, for this presentation, I put together a slideshow that um, is actually built using Svelte. And um, so everything you're gonna see in the next little while, I put together not, it didn't actually take me that long to put it together. And um, so I have kind of an interesting background. I'm, I uh, spent some time in Los Angeles and New York and I uh, tried to break into the, to the um, entertainment industry. And um, so I have, but I've also been like a tech guy for a long time. And uh, so I've, I've had, uh, and I've worked on online interactive documentaries. So um, when Svelte came along, it was nice to see something that actually worked really well for the animation that I was uh, trying to do. And so everything that you see here is um, actually built with Svelte. And um, let's just hop right into it. So what I've got here is a series of templates that are stitched together. And as you see this template intersection variable that I've uh, kind of just thrown at the beginning here, it goes from zero to one, right? So that's the animation sort of uh, delta, if you will, between zero and one, anything like, and what this is is it's using intersection observers to, um, to uh, figure out the top from the bottom. And I've got this formula and I'll show later on how that works. But that's kind of what you're seeing here is that as, as I scroll, oh, here's a cute little bird. Uh, it's showing you like, as it comes up to like almost nine, it's hitting the top of the, the frame right there. So what I wanted to talk about actually was sort of a brief history of um, what I call modality. It's a technical term um, for, in terms of media. And specifically what it means is this, it's a classification of the sensory interaction. So like the input and the output between a computer and a human. And a lot of times what people sort of think of, or sort of simple examples that are very common are the mouse or the trackpad and the keyboard. Those are kind of, um, there are other ones too. This webcam right here is actually one. Um, I, the microphone that I'm using to record this, I don't have a very good mic, so I'm using my iPhone as an input. But um, these kinds of relays between a computer and a human are the modalities uh, into, into um, interaction. And so why am I going into this? Well, storytellers kind of think about these kind of things. Um, so in this sort of brief history, you know, like if you think about long ago with some of the oldest or the most abstract, maybe not long ago also, but sort of the most abstract kinds of art forms or mediums um, really are more the the tech the inputs and the outputs of these things or the tactility are just sort of more immediate um you know these famous cave paintings from france a long time ago um are just simple stencils people put paint they probably blew it on over their hands i don't actually know the i'm not, not an anthropologist i don't know the know how they did it but um or, you know, like this, this painting, which my five-year-old did two years ago, you know, and said, this one is magic because it has lava and a storm and chacks, which are sticks that go up and down in the storm, right? And he's like, so the, the sort of simplicity of the medium, if you will, A, made it very easy to work with. And um, so that's kind of important for my talk in the sense that like, and I'll get to this later on, but like, just kind of tuck that away in your mind um, that, that, you know, these, these elements were just very, very crude and basic and easy to work with.
Um, it's easy to just be abstract if you need to. Um, as time went on, um, you know, we had other raw materials that people would work with. And as, the, as language developed, they developed tools to like, um, to sort of match the medium, if you will, so like sheepskin, leather, stone, plaster, metal. The, and then, you know, like they would develop like papyrus out of reeds or um, uh, chisels out of metal and stone and start, you know, the medium got a little more sophisticated and with that sophistication, it, um, you could you could do more sophisticated things with it, but it took more effort and more time and more knowledge. And um, as time sort of went on, the uh, that sophistication sort of you know, obviously in our modern day, uh, we've seen this sort of explosion or proliferation of like um, invention, and you know really as far back as as sort of like. We, we often cite Gutenberg, um, but with each, with each medium, there was still a sort of time window. And I think photography is a very good example of this where, um, the medium did not mature like right away necessarily. Sometimes the medium would actually, um, not be considered a, a uh, medium necessarily, which was the case with photography, uh, in the sense, in the strictest sense of like, as an art form or as like a, as a, um, and, and so like, you know, as these things have been around long enough, uh, photography is significantly considered an art form now, or, you know, um, all kinds of like, you know, you think about, um, the newspaper, the article, the book, those are all um, established mediums, uh, opera, play, film, you know, and that has been because the technology has, has developed long enough. But again, with these mediums, there is a, uh, a certain level of sophistication that, that, um, and tooling that uh, has developed around it. And, um, you know, and then we enter the digital age. And so what you have now with the, with the digital age is just like, um, and I put this kind of corny 80s uh, Commodore 128 commercial up about, um, just to sort of symbolize like how crude, you know, like the digital age is. And I'm, I'm of the opinion that we're still actually um, kind of, it's kind of in its infancy as a medium. And, and you know, I've, I've written, I've had to like put my thoughts on, on, I've written, like a, I wrote an article on Medium once. I worked on a, on, uh, like I said, I worked on an interactive documentary and it really kind of opened my mind to like the potential of this medium. And it's not really, um, I would say expanded to that, to that, uh, to its full maturity yet. And I, I think there's a long way to go. And in a way it's because like with digital, it's almost like you can do anything or, and, and engineers, if engineers can think it, they can put it together, but it takes a really, really a hard set of complexity. Like, you know, engineering is not just this simple craft and, um, and, um, not everyone's built to do it. Um, and I have a, uh, there's sort of a favorite um, uh, evangelist, uh, like tech evangelist, his name is Brett Victor. And um, <clears throat> he um, he's done several sort of presentations. He did, and I'm gonna show you a clip here from one where he did a presentation about um, basically, uh, he pretended like it was 1979, July 9th, 1979. And, and he's like, in the future, computing is going to be this. These are all the amazing things that are going to happen in computing. And he was very tongue in cheek. Um, and he he outlined like what will happen, you know, and, and we won't get stuck in any trap or or sort of, uh, you know, like thinking that it just needs to be one way because we'll be so advanced in the future. And then, of course, like as a joke, he, he presented how all the things that we are doing now. So I'll. I'll put a link to that that talk in the description, but um, 
this is I the most poignant part of that I just pulled out a clip and I wanted to play that and let his words sort of speak for himself. The real tragedy would be if people forgot that you could have new ideas about programming models in the first place. So let me explain what I mean by that. The, here's what I think the worst case scenario would be, is if the next generation of programmers grows up never being exposed to these ideas. The next, generation, the next generation of programmers grows up only being shown one way of thinking about programming. So they kind of work on that way of programming, they, they flesh out all the details, they you know, kind of solve that particular model of programming, they, they figured it all out. And then they teach that to the next generation. So that second generation then grows up thinking, oh, it's all been figured out. We know what programming is. We know what we're doing. They grow up with dogma. And once you grow up with dogma, it's really hard to break out of it. Do you know the reason why all these ideas and so many other good ideas came about in this particular time period, in the 60s, early 70s? Why did it all happen then? It's because technology, it was, it was late enough that technology had kind of got to the point where you could actually kind of do things with computers, but it was still early enough that nobody knew what programming was. Nobody knew what programming was supposed to be. And they knew they didn't know, so they just like tried everything. Their minds were totally free and they just like said, maybe we could program like this, maybe we could program like that. They just you know, tried anything they could think of. So, you know, as you can see there, like, um, and, and I, I really kind of agree with, with a lot of what he says. He's, he's, uh, he's got a, um, he put together a company, and I, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but they, the point of the company is to explore really sort of um, different programming models that are not like everything that we're just so locked into today. And um, some examples of this, I think we could sort of, you know, like over, over a long period of time, I think we've gone from like, um, we've made like just incremental movements in the world of, specifically in the world of like animation or, or, or um, design on the web. And, you know, like early on it was tables to CSS. Um, later we had like jQuery, we could do more, you know, right? And then, but then sort of modern frameworks broke that, broke that apart. Um, and now, now modern frameworks, everyone's kind of like, uh, feeling the heraldry of that. And, um, you know, I, I think that there's a case to be made, and this is kind of where we're going to be talking about Svelte, that, that the next sort of level of this, uh, um, this tool set um, is in JavaScript compilers. And um, Svelte is not a panacea by, by any means, but I will say that, um, and there was a, there was a tweet that, that went out just the other day where, um, uh, a, a big fan of, of, of Svelte had said, I will, I will trade Svelte any day for, uh, for um, over um, the new React, I, I'm forgetting the, the name of it right now, the, but, um, and, uh, you know, the idea being that, like, we're, even, even Svelte, I think, is kind of, uh, you know, might be stone ages in the, compared to what comes in the future. But um, enough talk about that. I think I'd like to sort of break down. So I had um, in this presentation, the whole, all the animation and all the video and all the, and all that stuff was sort of controlled by Svelte. And I think we can actually get into the code now and, and run some examples. Um, so you can actually see like how I put this together. Okay. So what we've got here is uh, basically just um, the hello world setup, um, and I'm just going to kind of run through like a very very simple example before I get into something a little more complex. Um, as you can see, like um, so, I'm actually running a Sapper project, and I've got some kind of unique set set up uh, things that we don't need to go into like uh, we don't really need to t cover all these files or anything but basically i've got uh just my index here and then i have like um i have some some other stuff that's that's in here that 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 will kind of uh, cover a few things but um uh the main thing to note is just 
first of all, that I, I've got some bindings on the window here to capture the scroll behavior. And I also have this inner height thing, which um, isn't really relevant for the hello world example, but it will become relevant a little later. Um, and then I've got this uh, modal, you know, this window here, which is um, this file over here, which I'll, co I'll come back to in just a second. But first I wanted to just point out that I'm actually just watching um, on the, uh, the scroll and its variable that's um, updating a store and that's over here this this writable story scroll and so I can access that anywhere I need to um, same thing with the inner height here um, and so if I come over to my to my you know modal blank my, my blank modal I am actually um, I have this thing called an intersection observer and um, this is sort of where all the magic happens. And I, I, um, I set this up basically to be used anywhere I, you know, anything that I want to grab and, and intersect. And if you don't know what the intersection observer is, um, it's basically a JavaScript uh, API that lets you um, find out where DOM elements intersect with um, with the viewport um, and you sort of specify that based on like root margins and thresholds and I have this root margin with sort of these odd pixels here because I wanted to like account for this bar and uh, just make sure that it fit perfectly and then I and then it the thresholds are that as you scroll it will you know bind to these these uh, thresholds as you're going through now, I, um, and then I have this intersecting variable that um, gets, gets changed every time, um, every time that, the, that, that a given DOM element comes into the view of the viewport or, or out of view. And really, this is the most, uh, and by the way, I'm going to share all this, uh, I'll put a link. Um, in in the in the description of the of the video uh, for for this, I've got a GitHub repo which is open. But basically, um, I'm I'm finding the uh, the top and the height of the um, of whatever element. So so this whole square here would be like an element, for example, and I get the the bounding client rectangle on it, and then I just do some math. Basically, I'm finding the um, division of the height of the element rel and the, the height of the element plus the scroll top relative to the view height, the window height. So, so this threshold basically gives me a number from zero to one uh, on where it's scrolled into position, and so if you look at, um, as I scroll on this, if, if I go in here and I throw in this threshold variable, which is bound um, here and then uh, is bound to the element here and I save this, you'll see that it actually is, and it's actually not starting at zero because the element is already in view. It would start at zero if it was all the way, way down here. But um, it's starting a little bit above zero, and then as I, you know, as I clock out at the bottom here, it would go to one, except it's not also panning completely out of view. Um, but that's the idea. So, so if I wanted to get the full zero to one, I'd have to put something above that would that make this go out of view all the way, and something below that would make it go out of view all the way. Um, so then, once we have this zero to one uh, ratio, uh, percentage setter, we can do all kinds of fun things with it very quickly. So, um, as just sort of a fun example, let's change this, the font size on this um, really quickly. You say font size, you know, um, would equal to like, I'm using this 
Well, let's just do pixel for now. That'll be a little easier to understand. And then, um, you know, you set the threshold. If we did just threshold, it would be microscopic because it's like point something. So uh, instead, what you have to do is you have to think, well, what size do I want to go up to? So let's say we were going to go up to like a, a, a hundred, you know, uh, in the course of scrolling. And if you save that, then as you scroll, ta-da. So you can see it's like really easy once you have this intersection observer all set up. I've only set this up one time and then I just use it all over the place for wherever I want as I'm scrolling. So if we wanted to like do something, um, you know, let's say that, you know, we wanted to do something actually more performant, um, could use a transition of like scale and then use the, use the threshold that way. And again, it has to be something above, uh, well, in this case, it would just scale to its natural size, um, except uh, or slightly under. Let's see, I did something wrong here. Transform. Yeah, so now it would just scale up to its normal size. Um, it's slightly, again, it's slightly under one in this case. But yeah, so that's just kind of the simple hello world. Uh, next, we'll, we'll move on to something a little more advanced that I've set up uh, to show. All right, so what I've done here is I've set up um, uh, this. We're going to work on this sprite. And I have, I've um, taken these, um, these sprites here for like sort of animated uh, I got these off a of free site, um, and we're going to try and animate those. So I've um, I've sort of done a little work already in advance. Um, I'm, we're not going to delve too much into some of the like CSS, other than the, just to see that we have the sprite images um, ready ready to go. And the main thing that we need to do is um, you know here's our here's our intersection observer like we had before. Um, letting us know if we've intersected or if there's a threshold, you know, on the element. And here's the element right there. And then we're just going to start putting stuff in here. And um, basically, so, you know, right now we've got, got a blank slate. Um, if you scroll down into view, and one other, one other thing that I note before that I, just to get the full zero to one kind of effect, I did actually put a whole block above it and a block, a block below. Um, also, you can see here, I've got this sort of full fade here with um, some sticky positioning. Um, so the content inside will actually just sit inside while the whole thing, this 600 uh, screen high, this six screen high uh, container moves along. And that's what you're seeing this fade pass behind. Um, but anyway, let's just start sort of putting, assembling some pieces. So I have, um, I have this background sky container and then that's, that's, you know, all these backgrounds right here, have, like I said, have kind of been put together beforehand. So let's say that we want to move these, um, you know, uh, from side to side. Um, there's, these are some other images that I had also assembled beforehand. And um, basically what we're gonna do is kind of put put on here some sort of threshold. And the reason why I'm putting like um, negative on it is because I want them to move from right to left, right? We wanna, we wanna go uh, to the negative on the X axis. So I kind of went, and went ahead and figured this out ahead of time that like that looks about Right. Um, so if, if we come back over here and save this now, you'll see that this, um, oh yeah, this is the back background sky. I did this wrong. This should be Y. Um, kind of will go up, right? So it kind of will float up a little bit. And I'm not worried about this gap right here because I'm gonna fill some stuff in right there. But you can see that's happening. 
So now um, let's uh, let's go ahead and put some mountains in. And uh, what's this called? Mountains far, right? So um, these will be sort of the background mountains. And um, again, we're going to just kind of use that threshold. Um, put some nice little trees in there, Bob Ross style. And um, this one is on the x-axis. Uh, so it will be a negative, a negative threshold. And I figured this out ahead of time that like about 400 was kind of a nice flow. You can see like, that's not moving. Um, because I'm missing my REM. So I've set also something to note. I did this kind of weird thing. I have this, um, is it in there? No, it's in, um, yeah, I, I use, uh, I actually have this kind of thing that I do where I set the pixel to one, one to one on REM, just so you're, in case you're wondering like what REM means here, it's actually one, the same as one pixel. Um, so yeah, so this this now moves this mountain, okay? So um, I went ahead and uh, um, we'll just kind of copy and paste some stuff that I did beforehand. So I've got some nearer tree, some closer mountains, some far trees and some nearer trees. And I, you know, have sort of the same thing going on here, negative fresh, negative, uh, translation on the x-axis. So, um, ah, really nice. Looks great. Okay, now I have um, also set up ahead of time, and I'm not going to get into all the details. I think we're just going to kind of walk through it, but I've got this, the sprite man that I set up, and basically, sorry, there's sort of two levels here. There's this sprite that I'm actually using the canvas tag for. Okay, so interestingly enough, you can actually uh, use the threshold right on the canvas tag. And the way that I'm doing that is that I'm, whatever the threshold's at, I multiply by 100, and then I divide by eight and round that so that the current, so this would, you can consider this as the index of the frame. And if you look at the sprite, um, I'm drawing on the canvas, clearing and drawing on the canvas every time the current changes um, using that threshold again. So, so if we go and, uh, you know, um, dump in this sprite image, this, this man right here, uh, this running man, um, it should just work. Oh, there he goes. He's on a mission. I'm off to save the svelte. Uh, so this isn't that fun. So without, you know, there's no sound, right? So I, I went ahead and added some sound. Um, maybe you knew that from seeing that. And um, again, it this one, I'm not actually using the threshold. Um, it, now I'm just like paying attention to what inset, uh, intersects. Um, but if you look at the audio clip, I do some sort of advanced tweening. And this, this is out of the, out of the box um, spelt uh, tweening mechanism for turning up the volume when it's in, in, in the pane. <laughs> So you can see, you can do some pretty cool and advanced stuff here. And it fades out and fades in really nicely. Run backwards. So that's about it um, for now. Um, again, my name is uh, Robert Hall, and you can find me on Twitter uh, at ArxPoetica, or um, my website is arxpoetica.com. 
Um, if you have any questions, I'll be available during the, the day. And um, yeah, it's been fun. Thank you.